the Belt Road Initiative and its impact in Africa. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. China is marking the 10th anniversary of its massive Belt and Road Initiative that is having a major economic impact in regions across the world. Countries throughout the continent of Africa have seen transformative changes to their developing economies from BRI investment and construction. Kenya is just one example. The Chinese-built Standard Gauge Railway now connects the port city of Mombasa with Nairobi. We begin with this report from CGTN's Robert Nagila. The railway is part of the Belt and Road Initiative, an ambitious program by China that aims to improve regional connectivity and economic integration through infrastructure development. An important aspect of the BRI is technology and skills transfer. Since the SGR began operations, Chinese engineers have passed on valuable maintenance and repair experience to their Kenyan colleagues. You learn new things about maybe technology. Maybe in Kenya, they have not done something like uh, manufacturing. In, in their country, there's those things like manufacturing is something big. To, so you learn something extra. In collaboration with the Kenya Railways, CRRC has designed a training program for engineering students from local universities. Engineering student Tanisha Imali is currently on attachment. Started with the integrated team, then locomotive team, and now I'm on the engine team. Launched in 2017, the Standard Gauge Railway is Kenya's largest infrastructure project since independence. It was constructed by the China Road and Bridge Corporation, a subsidiary of CRRC, that was contracted by the Kenya Railways Corporation at a cost of $3.6 billion. The railway line serves as a model for Sino-African cooperation. With 33 stations along the line, the railway has revolutionized rail transport in the country. As a result of the SGR's efficiency, reliability and speed, freight transportation has witnessed rapid growth, helping to decongest the port of Mombasa. Bob Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. For much more on how the Belt and Road Initiative is impacting Africa, joining me from Cape Town is former South African ambassador to the United States, Ibrahim Rasool. Also with us is Kingsley Molaha. He is a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Joining the discussion from Beijing is Einar Tangen. He is a senior fellow with the Tahia Institute and the founder and chair of Asian Narratives. And also with us is Abdullahi Boro Halaki. He is an Africa security and policy analyst. I want to welcome all of you to the show. Ibrahim, why don't I start with you? Uh, because uh, South Africa was the first African country to join the BRI. Can you walk us through what you've seen as a result of, of this uh, close work along South Africa with China? Look, I think that South Africa has indeed been one of the pioneers in the relationship with China. I think it's also joined China and other countries in the BRICS. And I think that the impact um, on South Africa has been quite enormous. I think in a short while, China became the number one trading partner um, with South Africa. I think in a short while, um, China moved right to the top three of the investment partners in South Africa, as well as um, lending facilities that have opened up, particularly in the sphere of infrastructure um, and other um, such economic programs. But I think that what has been phenomenal as a result of South Africa, in a sense, beginning to open that road and facilitating, for example, Africa's entry also into the BRICS alignment and particularly the relationship with China, I think if you now look at the 10th anniversary of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, 52 African countries have signed up, together with the African Union Commission, have signed up to the BRI agreement. And the result is that across the African continent, the impact is greater than even in South Africa, more than 6,000 kilometers of both rail as well as in the road, 20 ports, 
80 power plants, 130 hospitals, and 170 schools. So what is happening is that it's more than just investment in infrastructure. It is also the social investment, um, the trade investment that is beginning to, to take shape. And so all in all, I think that um, Africa has benefited from uh, um, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and Africa being a key set of markets for that. And I think that Africa for the first time also has choice in terms of preferential loans um, and as well as negotiating its debt reduction. So I really think that um, there is much to celebrate um, after 10 years um, of the BRI. Ibrahim, let me ask a follow-up on that. We started with Robert Nagila's story uh, there in Kenya, the uh, train going from Nairobi over to Mombasa. Back in the 90s, early 90s, I actually took that train. And at the time, I felt like I was in an old movie. The train was quaint and slow. And I wasn't in a hurry to get to Mombasa, but a lot of people are. I mean, if, if you're trying to move goods, uh, a slow train is not the way to do it. And I was looking at the uh, Agenda 2063 goals that came out in 2015 from the African Union. And of course, crucial to that was transportation infrastructure, the ports, the rails, the roads, uh, so key in terms of actually exports. You're, you're, it's a huge liability if you can't move your products uh, quickly. And uh, so I want to talk about, you know, basically the infrastructure in the continent. Uh, in fact, about 75,000 kilometers of rail line was, was basically a legacy from the European colonialism and really in a state of decay. So as you look at those goals of 2063, 2063 I mean, you can't really achieve those, uh, I wouldn't think, some of these countries without a boost from the BRI. No, and I think that the BRI has proven the knock-on effects um, on trade and export capacity for, for, for Africa. Um, I think what is beginning to happen with a BRI initiative is that you can standardize the gauge. I mean, the African colonial system had left us with multiple gauges in which railway could not speak to each other. For the first time, I think we're beginning to think through all of that and beginning to standardize it. I think we're also beginning to make the, the, the transport faster and more efficient. If I can just give you one idea, I mean, I've just been astounded that the um, Addis Djibouti um, rail connection has boosted um, Ethiopian GDP um, tremendously out of dire poverty um, a while ago to almost a 10% uh, GDP growth rate. And that's all because there is an efficient movement um, of goods, there is efficient logistics that's happening, and the soft infrastructure is beginning to follow the hard infrastructure um, so that um, one can unlock the African potential much, much quicker and much more efficiently. Kingsley, let me ask you the question. Uh, is it a game changer for the African continent? I think it's a boost, but its impact um, has been a bit uneven, and it, it depends on the capacity and the ability of different countries that have engaged with China in the BRI initiative uh, to be able to make uh, the best use of it. It's certainly been game-changing in Ethiopia. It's certainly been game-changing in Kenya with the uh, Nairobi-Mombasa railway. Um, in Nigeria, for example, about 700 kilometers of roads, uh, of railways, um, are being constructed uh, under the BRI. And we have now the lagos Ibadan uh, railway. We have the Abuja-Kaduna rail. And we now have just recently opened uh, the first part of the um, Lagos uh, Metro light rail. So it's been certainly uh, an important boost for Africa's uh, infrastructure ambitions. Um, but, but I think we should put it in a broader context. This is not charity. This is business. This is China's strategic state interest uh, to, to project power and influence globally, not just in Africa. Uh, and it's also part of its uh, geopolitical competition with the Western world. Now, you know, African countries have a number of problems, one of which is that there is a major focus, or there was at the beginning, a major focus on Africa's natural resources. And many countries were being made to pledge natural resources in return for these investments. A number of African countries are be becoming a bit more reluctant to use their natural resources as, you know, uh, a pledge, you know, for infrastructure 
projects. And we have to also question whether Af China is committed to the new wave in Africa of you know, value addition to its natural resources inside the continent before export, rather than just shipping it out. I think that's one of the things that will demonstrate uh, the nature of China's commitment uh, to Africa's infrastructure ambitions. But overall, I would say that BRI has been, um, has had a net positive effect, um, yes. Einar, let me ask you about what uh, Kingsley just said. Uh, uneven development, uh, he's indicated that some of this may be agenda-driven. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, quite frankly, if China had not come in, I, I don't know where uh, Africa would be right now. Um, it had not fared well, very well, uh, under the colonial and post-colonial uh, issues. We can see that quite clearly in areas like Malawi, et cetera. Uh, where there's a real discontent uh, with the way that the, in particular case, the French were in essence uh, getting uh, resources at low cost. I mean, I, I think there are always criticisms that can be leveled and improvements that can be made. Uh, for instance, China switched its financing platform from doing uh, country to country, government to government loans to project loans, and this is very important. The country-to-country -country loans soon became politicized. Uh, one, whenever the uh, government changed, the only thing you knew for certain is that they would criticize anything that the previous government had done, especially with loans from China. Now, with this new structure, where it's about the <clears throat> viability of particular projects, uh, things are going much, much more smoothly. But, you know, this, this idea that uh, China has to make a commitment to Africa, I think, is the wrong way of approaching this. China is trying to have a shared future for mankind that includes Africa as well as South America, uh, Southeast Asia, the entire world, of U.S. and Europe included. Um, and this is all part of that. This is not, as, uh, as my colleague said, about charity. This is about a lifeboat in which we are all in and we need to uh, progress along. Uh, we need to figure out a way to row together instead of against it. I mean, climate change is going to affect it. Uh, you know, looking forward into Africa's future, you're going to have the largest uh, young population of workers by 2040 in the world and where are the job is going to come from. What China has been offering is instead of shipping machinery that as soon as it breaks down is left in the fields, uh, they've been sharing technology. They've been actually making sure that these trains can be serviced not in China, but actually in Africa. So th this is a major difference between uh, what is out there. This idea that people have to do something for Africa, I think is the wrong approach. I wasn't suggesting um, that China owes Africa um, anything. I was simply suggesting that it's for Africa to negotiate its strategic interest in its partnership with China under the Belt and Road Initiative to encompass its need to add value to its natural resources before export. That is Africa's strategic interest, and Africa should protect it in its relationships with China. That we shouldn't be so grateful uh, that we forget that. That's just the point I'm making. Go I understand ahead, your point, but let, let, let's be clear about this. This is not just China. Africa needs to do exactly the same thing with the entire world. As uh, the BRICS Plus meeting showed, uh, there is tremendous uh, strength if, in fact, the developing world, the global south and uh, central Asian countries were to come together, realize what resources they have, and start asking that all nations, not just China, but uh, uh, Europe and America in particular, start paying what is necessary for Africa to do its own climate change, to do its own development. So am I, I was reacting to this idea that it's somehow China alone uh, that is uh, the issue here. It is really uh, Africa standing up with the global south and uh, trying to make sure that they can uh, handle their own future, not ask others to do it. The broken promises of the 100 billion in climate change, uh, uh, dollars that were supposed to be uh, yearly available, which has never actually happened, only 10 percent and questionably, a lot of that 10 percent went to, uh, you know, companies associated with uh, these uh, colonial, uh, former colonial powers. 
So yes, I do agree with that, but I, I take a little umbrage that it's somehow uh, unique to China. Abdullahi, uh, you've been very patient to uh, get you into the conversation. I saw you nodding your head in a couple of spots. I guess uh, to Kinsley's point, you, you know, he talked about an uneven uh, approach in some respects, but, but getting back to what Einer was saying, um, you know, there's going to be some natural growing pains, right? And there's going to be course corrections along the way. What's your overall take on the last 10 years? I just want to make a couple of comments. Number one, the idea, the level of the ambition that the Chinese have shown in engagement with Africa, whether one can look at it as charity or a strategic calculation from China, is very important because post-colonial Africa has not brought what Africans expected. But here is an opportunity over the last 10 years, large-scale infrastructure project that needs to move Africa and majority of Africans, particularly those in the rural areas in terms of energy, transport, um, that is what is required for the Africa to transform. That's number one, ambition, the scale of ambition. Number two, we've got to be clear with ourselves that 10 years is a very short period of time in the long arc of what development should be. Number three, the idea shouldn't always be Africa against China, Africa against Europe. African elite, ourselves, particularly on this panel, should be very, very clear. It's not always a question of others trying to take advantage of us, but what is the Africa's priority? What are some of these priorities? Have they been articulated very well? You know, the transnational railways, the transnational um, uh, oil refineries that needs to be constructed. So Africa needs to come out and say that these are our priorities, these are the terms of engagement, this is what we need. Short of that, nobody is out there who is going to take care of Africans that will take care of African issues than African themselves. So I think the challenge really for me is for Africans to be very, very clear who can serve some of their interests and why they choose some path and not others. What China and BRI has shown is that it is articulated Africa, not as a problem to be solved, but opportunity to be engaged with. And Africans should, should therefore then take this as an opportunity and you and run with it because there are so many people who are interested in Africa. Whether their interests are for their own interest or not, while important, it should not supersede the interest of Africa or regarding on what it wants. It's interesting, my colleague Anna Naidu spoke to the president of Sierra Leone when he was over here in the United States attending the UN General Assembly, and he also talked about the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's listen to his comments. We have had quite a lot of projects uh, completed, undertaken and completed, some, some of them within a year or two. Um, um, I can talk about bridges, I can talk about roads, I can talk about, uh, there are quite a lot. Um, like I said earlier, whenever China has promised, they have not attached strings. Sierra Leone, of course, one of the uh, countries that have benefited from the Belt and Road Initiative. Einer, let me direct the question to you. Why has Africa figured so prominently in, Ch in China's approach with the Belt and Road Initiative, would you think? Well, there's been a historic, a long historical uh, relationship. It was Africa who supported China in the UN uh, and uh, literally pushed it over the line in terms of uh, uh, votes on the particularly sensitive issues. Um, and it's, uh, you know, there's a, a match there because China has um, low resources per person. It needs resources and needs to import them, add value, and then export them. So obviously, South America, Africa, um, um, uh, different parts of the world, Central Asia, they have these resources. China has been building a, you know, a network uh, that brings them in. But Africa does have a very special uh, part. I mean, I, I run into people constantly uh, who talk about the Tanzanian railway. Uh, they had relatives who worked on it. And, and there was this really sense of, of kinship, of creating change that was good for everybody. Uh, that's a very important part of what uh, so many people in China stand for, not only in terms of their own country, but also in terms of what they 
what they want for the rest of the world. They want people to enjoy the kind of prosperity that they've been able to create here. But each country has its own path. I do agree with um, my colleagues uh, that that is an individual decision based on priorities that are set not in Beijing or Washington, but in uh, the various countries. But I, I think it's important we do not talk about Africa as one entity. Uh, it is, uh, you know, a whole bunch of countries, very, very different development paths, uh, all sorts of things. And you have to be very uh, careful about that. Uh, China is not a savior for all of them. It can engage in trade. Uh, there is, you know, has to be a fair trade. I agree with that. Uh, but it's it's not something where China gets a special price uh, for this or that. It's really just about what is Africa's needs and how it can work together with China uh, for both of their benefits. And Rasul, that's a, a yeah, really good yeah, point. Yeah, let, me, let, me, let me just okay, chime in there. It's, yeah. it's very important. Um, the Tanzania Zambia railway. The Tanzania and Zambian government really tried to raise more money for that railway line. And it was ridiculed out of town by the same people who right now are saying China is settling Africa with debt. All right. So for me, what this raises is that most African countries now, there are opportunities out there. Uh, it's not just limited to Brussels, London, and Washington, and IMF and World Bank. There are other actors in town that Africans need to be very strategic on how to engage with them. It's not either or. Like Africans, we've got to be careful that it's not either the West or China. Who gives Africa the most optimum outcome? And then they can use that one and get into it. And particularly at this time, when the global international order, the 1945, um, you know, order is under tremendous strain with everybody trying to do everything, Africans need to be strategic rather than being handed charity or being used as a pawn in the geostrategic uh, drama. Rasul, I spoke to the Egyptian foreign minister about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, and he says it dovetails nicely with their 2030 vision for comprehensive development. Uh, let's listen to what he had to say, and then I want to get your response on the other side. Well, we think that uh, the interconnectivity that is created by the Belt and Road, the uh, potential uh, subsequent effects uh, in uh, increased levels of trade and uh, commerce and uh, uh, the relationships uh, and investments opportunities that uh, the expansion and the refinement of the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative will, will create, uh, the dynamics that uh, fulfill our developmental objectives and, and uh, take advantage of the uh, infrastructure that we have developed over the last 10 years. So uh, we are set uh, to the implementative stage and uh, see the value of uh, greater economic integration among states that have traditionally always had a very strong uh, bilateral relations. You talked about uh, relationships and investment opportunities. Uh, just as a follow-up to what he had to say, I was looking at a, a report from the World Bank that BRI has increased the trade of participating parties by 4.1%. It's attracted 5% more foreign investment. So that's a big key, isn't it? No, absolutely. And, um and I think one can begin to see the shift in Chinese methodology of doing business with Africa. For one, we don't always just negotiate country to country. I think Africa now negotiates as a whole. The last round of negotiations have, for example, identified what I would call new generation investments, such as new tech in battery storage, um, renewable energy generation, trade infrastructure like pipelines, that's necessary. I mean, Huawei have just in, uh, is about to invest 300 million US dollars in African data centers, which will help accelerate um, the fourth industrial revolution. And then I think new deals on managing the resource flows. And I think it's particularly in those new deals on resource flows like minerals and so forth, that the idea of beneficiation um, could be built in. I also think the investment in Africa's human resources so that we can have the capacities for beneficiation and for managing the fourth industrial revolution. Today, there are more African students um, studying in China than, for example, um, in the West. I think 
Um, in, in the case of South Africa, where we are energy um, constrained and have deep problems, the investment um, into emergency energy funding um, has been has been quite um, quite welcome. So I think that we are introducing a new paradigm. I think it is um, resonating with President Xi's small and beautiful um, investment patterns. But I also think that the introduction of the Chinese private sector, Chinese state-owned enterprises, um, and and others um, directly into the projects of Africa, I think begin to give us um, the kind of leverage that Africa needs in its relationship with China. And Kingsley, uh, I don't want to belabor this World uh, Bank report, but uh, it does say that the GDP is also increasing for the de developing economies uh, by about 3.6 percent from 2012 to 2021. It also goes on to predict that uh, with that lift, uh, you're going to see somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40 million people lifted out of poverty because of the BRI. So it's not just roads and bridges and all of that. It, it does have an economic impact for people who live on the continent. It's really up to Africa to take a number of specific steps to benefit um, greatly from it. One of which is to make sure that projects that African countries negotiate, which are to be funded by loans, that those projects themselves should be revenue generating enough to pay back loans. Because we're beginning to see a number of situations of unsustainable debt burdens that have been created in Africa from some of these projects. I mean, we saw that in Zambia, for example. The other thing I think Africa should do while taking advantage of the BRI is not to lose sight of the fact that physical infrastructure alone will not be enough to address its development economic transformation challenge. Africa needs skills. Africa needs skilled human capital. And I think Ambassador Rasul um, alluded to that. That is a very primary uh, economic strategy focus that Africans uh, should should uh, should uh, you know beam in on. Uh, but overall, I think you know the uh, BRI initiative does hold a lot of promise. It needs to be tweaked, and it is being tweaked. They are moving now from large mega projects to smaller projects. Um, but we also note, I should note, what's going on that Chinese funding for BRI projects in Africa has reduced in the last few years um, to about two billion dollars over the last couple of years, whereas you know, in years past, it was more in the region of $10 billion to $20 billion. So China itself has had some internal challenges that has made it to take a different look uh, at some of its uh, external engagements. And so we should be aware of all these dimensions as we go forward in this partnership. But overall, a lot of promise. And, Einer, I'm going to give you the last word because we were just about out of time, but uh, he brings up this debt burden. We've heard here in the West a lot of people talking about this as a debt trap. I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the greatest debt burden is actually to uh, the West, uh, China, China, somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, percent, depending on where you are. It differs from country to country, obviously. Nigeria is a, a larger uh, recipient of uh, loans, et cetera. Um, but this, this idea that somehow uh, China is holding back, uh, you know, progress, you can't build things without investing money. Now, I do agree that there's got to be a longer time horizon on a lot of these loans. Uh, China has been uh, trying to do that with these low interest loans, et cetera. Uh, but it's not just China. There has to be a global acknowledgement that the changes in Africa, as well as South America and other places uh, that have resources, it does take time for that to go through. And especially when you start talking about soft issues, education, uh, medical, et cetera. The, the, you don't get immediate returns from that. That is something where you need 20, 30, even 40 years and for it to mature. Right. For instance, if you start a school program today, somebody's not going to be able to do much when they're seven years old. You have to wait till they're 40. Right, right. We're going to have to leave it there. It's been a great discussion. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Mike Walter sitting in for Ananaidu. Thanks for watching another edition of The Heat.